is The Chris Abraham Show. Hey there, this is the Chris Abraham Show. It is Season 5, Episode 16. And I am really sorry about not uh, posting anything earlier, but I've been so busy and things have been so crazy. Um, And I went down an AI rabbit hole and I've been exploring BARD and ChatGPT4+. And I've been uh, posting AI-generated Um, articles on Substack and then I deleted Substack and everything's been completely crazy and I go between not wanting to speak my mind and wanting to speak my mind and wanting to just erase all of my uh, thoughts from the internet and return to establishmentarianism but then I just feel pain when I hear propaganda. I just, ever since 9-11, I've cared. So, um, here I am. And the reason why I was compelled to record today on, uh, Sunday, May 28th, 2023 is because I'm listening to, and it's completely fascinating, The End of America by Naomi Wolf. And it is so interesting. Um, It's called The End of America, A Letter of Warning to a Young Patriot, and it's uh, circa 2007, so it happened, it was written post 9-11, it was written during what was easily perceived as a fascistic um, movement of America, Uh, post 9-11, the uh, two uh, Bush to Bush administration presidency. This is before Obama uh, took the White House, and uh, this is post Patriot Act. This is Guantanamo. This is um, the admittance of torture and uh, the admittance of, um, you know, all kinds of things the TSA, the um, um, everything, right? And uh, she does an amazing job. She does such a great job. And the I'm listening to it on Audible. So the the reader is just beautiful, beautiful voiced and uh, doesn't strike any kind of tone. So it's pretty extremely neutral. And I really like it for that. Um, what else? I should be over at the picnic tables, but I'm here right at the... Um, at the uh, Walter Reed Community Center playground. So if you hear kids playing in the background or if I get arrested by cops for sitting here, you'll know what it was. I wanted to sit down and check uh, check my phone and take a little break and have some water. And it's around 6 o'clock, so I needed to take my my nighttime meds. So I took a break here and then... Voila, people showed up. So, anyway, the book is fascinating, and I don't even know how to do it justice, but it said that uh, circa 2007, that the reset that always happens in American history mostly is not resetting anymore, which is the extreme swing of the, uh, the extreme swing of the pendulum, the pendulum that is American politics. And... I dare say I had a hard time identifying that because on the surface, you know, it looks like, um, it looks like what, uh, George H.W. Bush, right? And then to, uh, Bubba Clinton, right? And then to George W. Bush and then to Obama and then to Trump. 
and now to Biden, right? It seems like the um, it seems like the pendulum is in is in perfect harmony, and that is Foucault's pendulum, and that we have plenty of amazing movement, and it's completely smooth, and there's follow through, and it goes back and forth, and that's really awesome. But there's this thing uh, which I call um, Janus or or Janus or Janus, uh, the the two faces of Janus or Janus, which is um, the neocons and the neolibs. And I think as we move forward, we realize, especially in high relief in um, the Ukraine, or sorry, old men call it Ukraine, in Ukraine and the war of whatever they call it, the war in Ukraine, um, the, uh, the argument is that, uh, is that, you know, Dick Cheney and John McCain, uh, are in the same camp as is, um, the, the neo-libs like, like the Obamas, the Clintons, um, et al. So, uh, it is perceived that, um, you know, Nancy Pelosi is a neolib and that, uh, uh, Liz Cheney is a neo, uh, neocon and, uh, all that sort of thing. So, uh, and so that the, uh, the pendulum is, is merely theater now and that, uh, what is called, you know, that, that the, that the, I guess, bureaucracy of America, the, um, lifers, uh, the bureaucrats, the appointees, um, et cetera. I won't even use words like deep state, but people in the federal, uh, federal 20 years, federal lifers, people in the 17 intelligence organizations, people, uh, at the state department, people, um, at, uh, Homeland security, uh, people at justice, people, of course, at, um, department of energy, uh, people at, um, the, um, all the other departments, I, I will try to share them in the, in the liner notes. I want you to know that Bard and ChatGPT write my liner notes based on what I kind of say this is about. If I were smart, I would have this stuff transcribed, but it isn't. So my conclusion is that, um, is that you can see where everything's being nudged. It's really easy. I was reading a book. I don't know if it's the one that my buddy wanted me to read, which is, you know, uh, the black book of communism, but, uh, it was really interesting to, uh, realize through reading first, uh, first-hand accounts in historical perspective that the Nazis didn't call themselves the Nazis, right? The Nazis didn't call themselves fascists. The Nazis called themselves socialists. Uh, the Nazis might have called themselves nationalists. But um, in the Spanish Civil War, it was a war between the nationalists and the socialists. And the nationalists called the socialists communists and the socialists called the nationalists fascists, right? And at no point in time did, um, did, um, 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 Mussolini call himself a fascist. He was called a fascist because of the, um, I guess they call it, uh, the faggot of sticks or the faggot of arrows that, um, uh, is the fascist, is it? The fascist, the, the bundle, the bundle of sticks that is representative of Rome. Is that right? The, um, arrows and sticks representative of Rome, uh, of the Roman empire, uh, also manifest in Rome, New York, all that fun stuff. 
and that fash the fasci fascia uh is manifest into what fascism means right the um it's very precise to rome very precise to empire and very precise to um mussolini so fascism is nothing that not uh, the nazis the ss um goebbels uh goebbels um hitler the nazis whatever they didn't call themselves fascists or nazis those were names given to them so i did a thought experiment on both mastodon and twitter and i'm like how come socialism is not equal to fascism and how come communism is not equal to fascism and how come nationalism is equal to fascism and how come capitalism is equal to fascism and how come um and all these other things and people said well you know mussolini was totally a socialist until he became a fascist right uh until and so the calculus is that until you are considered an adversary you are a socialist as long as you're my ally you're a socialist the moment you become my enemy or my adversary you're a fascist people call people call um they call vladimir putin they call him a fascist they don't call zelensky a fascist i would dare say that um zelensky is a nationalist um the fighters in the ukraine in ukraine are fascistic i would say that um on one hand uh russia is being mistaken for being uh still a soviet empire vis-a-vis the soviet socialist republic and on the other hand it's considered a a um uh kleptocracy uh an auto- autocratic autocratic kleptocracy uh where putin is an autocrat he has an authoritarian authoritarian government he uses um uh he pursues uh pu- the purity of nationalism the purity of of um of of uh of ethnic uh clean ethnicity and ethnic cleansing and he is in fact a fascist who wants to uh take over uh the democratic socialist republic of europe so the use of fascism and nazi are obviously um anything to do with our opponent and adversary and as long as you use fascistic authoritarian um martial uh, autocratic authoritarian strategies in order to fight authoritarianism nationalism fascism nazism and literally hitler as long as you use those things it's permissible because you need to win by whatever means necessary this is laid bare obviously in uh in israel and i'm uh, i'm extremely zionist so i don't have anything against um the steps that uh israel has taken to make sure that it is able to maintain its existential uh existence and israel's threats are existential because its enemies um seem to want to end israel's existence however i hear most of those things according to israel so maybe iran wants to remove israel from the world in the same way that iran is told is said to want to eradicate or exterminate america from the world so could be just pr who knows i mean uh i remember in the 80s 
seeing the uh, Tehranians yelling death to America and burning American flags. But uh, Hill and Knowlton and Edelman PR have been known to do those things shamelessly and constantly and all the time. So I don't know necessarily if that's something that I should give credibility to. So I don't know. I feel like um, I'm going to do a little bit of research to find the 10 things uh, that uh, Naomi Wolf delineates to define what a uh, what a fascistic authoritarian uh, Nazi government this, the the ten signs of uh, of the movement towards that kind of anti liberty anti free anti constitutional anti free speech kind of form and gut form of government I really want to know what those things are. Uh, I am only uh, I'm only on chapter two and I have five hours and 13 minutes left and it's really exciting, but I didn't want to stop one more moment. Uh, didn't want to stop one more moment um, to wait to ask. So let me see. Maybe if I ask chat GPT, Okay, let's try this. Can you tell me what are the 10 things that Naomi Wolf thinks uh, indicate fascism in a country? Here we are. Here's Umberto Eco's 14 points. So let us look at that. I think that's even more interesting because I did mention um, Foucault's Pendulum, which is my one of my five, five top favorite books. Um, Immortality by Milan Kundera, uh, Bluebeard by Kurt Vonnegut, um, of course, uh, Foucault's Pendulum by Umberto Eco. Um, um, that. Um, Wind Up Bird Chronicles by um, Murakami. Uh, there's a couple others. But let's see what he says. According to, according to Umberto Eco, uh, the four, 14 Characteristics of Fascism uh, by Lawrence Britt. Um, the cult of tradition, traditionalism is of paramount importance, the rejection of modernism, the enlightenment, the age of reason is viewed as the beginning of modern depravity, the cult of action for action's sake, action being seen as beautiful in itself and to think before acting is a perceived weakness, disagreement is treason, criticism or disagreement is seen as betrayal, fear of difference, people who are different are seen as a threat. Appeal to social frustration. The gain of power is through the promise of dreams coming true for the masses. The obsession of a plot. The obsession with a plot. The enemy is both strong and weak. A perfect scapegoat. The enemy is both strong and weak. Um, the people feel besieged, which creates a constant state of urgency and fosters nationalism. Passivism is tracking, trafficking with the enemy. The concept of peace is seen as a weakness and detrimental to the value of values of society. Contempt for the weak. The society is in constant struggle and any kind of weakness must be scorned. Everybody is educated to, some, to become a hero. It, this creates a cult of death as everyone is expected to be willing to die for the cause. Machismo, which implies both disdain for women and intolerance and condemnation for non-standard sexual habits. Interesting. Uh, the selective populism. The common people are invoked as a rhetorical device, but when it comes to decision-making, it's usually an elite. Newspeak. The usage of an impoverished vocabulary and elements to re-syntax in order to limit the instruments for complex and critical reasoning. Uh, the Lawrence Britt's 14 characteristics include powerful and continuing nationalism, disdain for, disdain for the recognition of human rights, Identification of enemy scapegoats as unifying cause. Supremacy of the military. Rampant sexism. Controlled mass media. 
obsession with national security, religion and government are intertwined, corporate power is protected, labor power is suppressed, disdain for intellectuals in the arts, obsession with crime and punishment, rampant cronyism and corruption, and fraudulent elections. Now, if I say, end of America, can you give me the 10 points that Naomi Wolf says in End of America? Here we go. Got them. Here's the 10 that Naomi Wolf says. This is exciting, isn't it? Naomi Wolf is an American author and former political consultant. Her book, The End of America, A Letter of Warning to a Young Patriot, she outlines 10 steps that she argues historically dangerous and oppressive regimes have used to shut down their democratic procedures. According to Wolf, these steps are being observed in America. Here are the 10 steps as per Naomi Wolf. 1. Invoke a terrifying internal and external enemy. Use the fear of an external and internal enemy to control the population. Create secret prisons where tortures take place. Establish a system of secret prisons where torture is conducted away from the eye of the public or legal systems. 3. Develop a paramilitary force. Create a paramilitary force that operates without the constraints of constitutional norms. 4. Surveil ordinary citizens. Set up an extensive surveillance system to monitor the general populace, uh, creating... I hope this is still... Surveil ordinary citizens. Set up an extensive surveillance system to monitor for general popu- the general populace, creating an environment of paranoia and self-centership. Infiltrate citizens groups. Infiltrate and spy on citizens groups to cause suspicion and fear amongst people. Arbitrary detain and release citizens. Random detention and release of citizens can destabilize communities and target individuals without a trial or formal charges. Target key individuals. Discredit, target, and threaten influential individuals to reduce their credibility and influence over the populace. Restrict the press. Control or manipulate the press and other media to regulate the flow of information and control public opinion. Cast criticism as espionage and dissent as treason. Present any critique or dissenting voices as treasonous or as a threat to national security to stifle opposition and subvert the rule of law. Challenge, uh, change the legal framework or manipulate the law to escape accountability and justify the above actions. What is the definition of political prisoner and political prosecution? A political prisoner is a term used to describe a person who is imprisoned because their ideas, beliefs, or political activities are deemed a threat by the governing authority. This typically involves those who oppose or criticize the government, and their imprisonment is a tool to silence their dissent. The definition can vary, but Amnesty International, for for instance, defines political prisoner as any prisoner whose case has a significant political element, whether the motivation of the prisoner's acts, the acts in themselves, or the motivation of the authorities. Political prosecution, on the other hand, refers to the use of legal systems or or judiciary by the state or target to target individuals or groups for political reasons. It is a form of repression typically employed by authoritarian regimes to silence dissent, stifle opposition, and maintain control. Political prosecution often involves trumped up or exaggerated charges and unfair trials. While every country's legal system gives the state the power to prosecute individuals for crime, a political prosecution tends to involve the misuse of this power for political ends rather than purely for the enforcement of the law. What is the definition of kangaroo court? 
A kangaroo court is a term used to describe a court that ignores or significantly deviates from standard legal procedure in the interest of expediency. It is categorized by its lack of impartiality and fairness, often with the outcomes decided in advance. In a kangaroo court, principles of justice and rights of the defendant are totally disregarded, violated, or both. These types of courts might uh, make use of false evidence, ignore relevant evidence, or distort the rules and conventions of legal ethics and fairness. The term kangaroo court is generally used in a derogatory sense to imply the court lacks uh, legitimacy in its proceedings and outcomes are not to be trusted. This term is often used to criticize judicial proceedings that appear to be biased, unfair, or otherwise corrupted. What is the definition of a show trial? (laughs) A show trial is a type of public trial in which the judicial authorities have already determined the guilt of the defendant. The actual trial is merely a display to provide the illusion of justice. It is typically conducted by a totalitarian government to suppress dissent and opposition or to propagate certain propaganda. The main goal of a show trial is not to determine guilt or innocence, but rather to further the authority's political propaganda or personal agendas. The outcome of a trial is usually predetermined, with the accused effectively uh, serving as a prop in a public spectacle. Key characteristics of of show trials include a lack of genuine due process, the use of false or coerced confessions, the presence of a highly theatrical or propagandistic court proceedings, and the public nature of the trial means to serve as a deterrent to others or to shape public opinion. Fascinating, fascinating, fascinating. Um, I don't know what other... What is it when uh, you do political nudging? What is a political nudge or a hearts and mind nudge? Nudging is a concept in behavioral science, political theory, and economics which proposes positive reinforcement and indirect suggestions as ways to influence behavior and decision making. In a political context, a nudge is a subtle policy shift that encourages people to make decisions that are in their broad self-interest. It's not about forcing people to make certain decisions, but rather making desired options more appealing or more accessible. For example, a government may want to promote healthy eating moving its citi- among its citizens. Instead of passing laws or regulations that restrict unhealthy food, it might use nudges. This could include strategies like arranging fruit and vegetables at eye level in school, cafeterias providing clear and easily understandable nutrition information on food packaging, or even creating campaigns about the benefits of a healthy diet. A hearts and minds nudge in a political context would aim to change people's deep-seated attitudes, beliefs, or values, effectively winning over their hearts and minds. This often requires a more profound and comprehensive approach, involving a mix of communication, education, and sometimes strategic policy changes. A goal is to build support and acceptance over a long term rather than enforcing immediate compliance. In both cases, the intention is to uh, influence... um, uh, decisions subtly rather than by using overt coercion or legislation. The effectiveness is of such strategies is a topic of ongoing research and debate. Well, that's all for now. Um, what do you think? I mean, I have over five hours left of this, but there's a couple other books by Naomi Wolf. I want to read her sub stack. Um, I don't know. I think I'll just come back and share what I'm reading and share what I'm thinking. I didn't like doing it on Substack because I was cheating and just coming out with like a 300 word prompt and then having uh, and then ad- adapting the prompt until I got what I wanted to say, but I wasn't actually using my own words. Um, thank you very much. Uh, love you guys. I'm not going to include out of contact me. If you nobody listens to this anyway, I'm not going to go through the boogity, boogity, boogity to do it. So. Uh, come and find me, come and, uh, subscribe, share all that fun stuff. Give me awesome stars and everything else. And I'll talk to you guys soon. Happy Memorial day. And, um, I hope to get this up tonight. I'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.
Thank you for listening to The Chris Abraham Show. Make sure you subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. Until next time.